we can see that we still need the Lord after we have faith in Him. Because as we are being sanctified, we can see how we stand by looking at the Word of God, which includes the law. Where the problem arises is that if we are crucified with Jesus Christ through faith and the old man is dead, then why do we battle with sin? And will you help me welcome Brother Kyle to the podium? Praise the Lord. Good morning. Do you need the Lord? He will help you. That's the title uh, this morning. This is part two. We ended last week with uh, talking about the law, and some people may not need the Lord because antinomianism is the name. They don't believe that the law is relevant whatsoever. And so we talked about that a little bit, that the law uh, for the Christian um, being as we were buried with Christ, it does not have dominion over us. And that's where we ended. And now we're going to get to the second half of the message. And now that we understand that the law has no dominion over us because we are crucified with Jesus Christ, does that mean the law has been repealed? Does that mean the law is gone now, it's extinct, it's no more? Absolutely not. We're going to go back to our uh, section we read last week, Romans 7, 7 through 14. This is where we ended last week, Romans 7. 7 through 14. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of con concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin." Paul in this passage says that sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me. It is not the law that's bad, but sin. He states that the law is holy, just, and good. You can't get any better than that, can you? Romans 3.28-31 Romans 3.28-31 Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? He is not also of the Gentiles, yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we make then void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Now, this looks a little bit confusing, doesn't it? Because it starts out, it says, if this passage starts out by talking about faith in Jesus Christ without the works of the law, then why would it end in saying that we establish the law? It says, it says that because the law shows our sin and points us to Jesus Christ and to have faith in Him. Okay? If we don't have no law, what kind of a thing or what, what kind of a standard do we have? 
And if we want to sit here this morning and say we have no law, as a Christian, if you're a true Christian, you can go ahead and say that. But when you start breaking the law of God consistently and without uh, any thought of the Lord, then watch out, you're going to be chastised, right? I want to read this in Romans chapter 12, 1 through 8. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For with what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all you are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. So, as a Christian, if you want to obey, disobey the law, you say there's no law, then you're going to get chastisement. If you disobey, and you're not chastised, then what are you? You're not part of the family. Also, when Jesus talked, was asked about the greatest commandment, he said this in Matthew chapter 22, 35 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, 35 through 40. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus says that all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. These two commandments are a, a repeat of the Ten Commandments. How do you love the Lord, your na- the Lord and your neighbor? Look at God's law and that will answer it for you. You will not get your righteousness from God's law. You get that from your faith in Jesus Christ. But you are blessed by being obedient to Jesus Christ's commands which is a reiteration of the law. We know that we are to be sanctified people looking more and more like Jesus Christ as time passes. Do you love the Lord? If you do, he says this in John 14, 12 through 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Very simple. What does it say in the New Testament about not doing certain things? And what do I mean by certain things? Lawless things, okay? First Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that their unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit 
the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The list of these items are shown in God's law as sin. And if you are continually practicing these, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not what I said. That's what the Word said. Correct? If you're being sanctified and walking in the Lord's light, then you will be growing in the Lord by reading all of God's Word, which includes the law. It says this in Psalms 1, 1 through 4. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. This passage says you're like it says you're like a tree planted by rivers of water if you meditate on the law of God. It says this in Hebrews 8:10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So we have the law. The Lord puts it in our heart, in our mind. I would say it's even more than the law. Jesus talks about the law. He says, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. But anyone who looks upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart. So he's even, give, he's even more than the law. And the Lord has put that within our hearts in our minds. We will see in the next section that we started out with last week in Romans that Paul gives an analysis of his up and down walk with the Lord. You may ask up and down according to who or what. The answer is he gives is the law that it is good and that the inward man delights in that law. Please turn to Romans chapter 7, 15 through 22. Remember, we're going through Romans chapter 7. Now we're at Romans 7, 15 through 22. Try to follow along here. He kind of tries to, uh, kind of gets a little bit dicey here. 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And my thought goes back to this, too, about Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God living within us. That's the inward man. And we know that Jesus Christ loved the law. Folks, because he was the law, he was the Word of God. He's the very essence of the law. It's plain to see that the law is not abolished just because we are dead to it by our union with Jesus Christ. The law is shown here to to show righteousness from unrighteousness. And yes, it was death to us when we were unbelievers because sin took occasion with it. But now that we are believers, 
and in union with Jesus Christ we delight in the law with the inward man, the new man who is in Christ. It says this in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prof- profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The law of God certainly gives correction and instruction. Now we come to the last three verses in Romans. 7, 23 through 25. Romans 7, 23 through 25. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I want to try to explain what Paul has written here a little bit. In summary, we can see that we still need the Lord after we have faith in Him, because as we are being sanctified, we can see how we stand by looking at the Word of God, which includes the law. Where the problem arises is that if we are crucified with Jesus Christ through faith and the old man is dead, then why do we battle with sin? The answer may be that if we are united to Jesus Christ by faith and the old man is crucified, then we have a decision to make. Walk in faith or unbelief. The man that we nourish will be the one who causes us to walk in defeat or victory. We can only perform that which is good by the power of the Holy Spirit and calling upon and needing the Lord. Paul says that the good that he would do, he does not do. And the evil he does not want to do, he does. Paul says that evil is present with him. That evil can only be present in the flesh. Because Paul delights after the law with the inward man. In order to have victory over the natural, we need the Lord. Now we're getting to the nuts and bolts about needing the Lord this morning. James chapter 4. 1 through 10. James 4, 1 through 10. He's going to talk about the same thing basically Paul did about what I do, I don't want to do, and fightings and so forth among us. James chapter 4, 1 through 10. For whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Anybody have a war in their members in here? Verse 2, ye lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. 
Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James states that we have wars because of the lust in our members. He also states that if we are a friend of the world, then we are an enemy to God. Being a friend to the world is nourishing the old man that should be dead because of our union with Jesus Christ. But we keep trying to keep him alive by our decision to live in that realm. There's two realms. There's two realms. And when we make that decision, then our desire, or what I call our want to, is to bend towards the things we don't want to do. To put it simply, we desire to do the things we want to at the point of decision because we have that desire at the time. If we're walking in the world, if we're a friend of the world, if we're not reading the scripture, then what is our want to going to be? It's going to be wanting to do what the old man, the flesh, desires. And that desire will be based upon our reliance and dependence upon the Lord. It's that simple. It's that simple. James states that the Lord gives grace to the humble, the people that live in submission to the Lord and resist the devil through the Lord's strength. I'm not saying we do this on our own strength. It's completely on the Lord. If you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. That's what it says. If you don't think you need him and can stand alone, then you will fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 12. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as, some, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all, those, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written in our, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Once we are in Jesus Christ, no one can take that away. John chapter 10, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Philippians chapter 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I want everyone to know this morning that they are secure in the Lord if they are his. 
but we must remember that we have the ability to walk contrary to his commands if we have no need or dependence upon him. And it can be a very serious fall. Reading through the Bible, you can see that many people had catastrophic failures because they made a decision to do their own thing. The Lord was going to kill Moses. David committed adultery. Samson had his eyes put out. Abraham had a child with Hagar. Jacob cheated his brother. Peter denied the Lord, and the list goes on and on. Even though they were not abiding in the Lord, they came through only because of one reason. We have a gracious God. But that doesn't get rid of reaping and sowing, right? You can be His. You can be rebellious. Do what you want to do as some of those did. The Lord will bring you through. But how many people want to have their eyes put out? Probably nobody this morning. We must abide in Him. Please turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, 1 through 11. John 15, 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Is nothing something? No. Six, if a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth, cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men to gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As a Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Let's reiterate what John just said. One, we must bear fruit. Two, we are clean through the word which he has spoken. Three, we cannot bear fruit unless we abide in Jesus. Four, without him we can do nothing Five, if you keep his commandments, you will abide in his love. At the end of this passage in verse 11, it says, These things have I spoken unto you that, you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. At the beginning, we asked the question, Do you need the Lord? He will help you. If you have a frame of mind of antinomianism, that you're saved and that's it, no matter what you do, you don't need the law, you don't need anything, then I think you're going to have a hard time walking in the joy of the Lord because we must abide in Him. We, we, we must trust in Him when we begin, and that trust must carry on. It must go forth and, and keep going. So in closing, I want to ask you this morning, do you need the Lord? And do you think he will help you if you come to him? We have decisions to make, and the decisions we make will have an effect on our desires. If you want to have full joy, then we must make the decision to look to the Lord and abide in him all day, every day. We are, not, we are dependent upon the Lord for our salvation, period. It's by faith alone and by grace alone. We, we have nothing to do with it. But once we're saved, 
guess what? It's decision time. We have decisions to make, and depending on how we make those is how we walk with the Lord. So in closing, I want to say, yes, we need the Lord, and we need Him desperately. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for your word, for your faithfulness, and Lord, for your abundance, for your good word, for your commandments, Lord, that we're not, that it doesn't have dominion over us, but Lord, we love your law after the inward man, Lord, just as you did, Lord. I just ask you to be with us this morning, Lord, as we go forth throughout the week, that we would just meditate upon your word, Lord, that we would keep it in our mind and our heart, and that we, we would do what's right in thy sight by your power and by your grace alone, Lord. Would you minister to everybody in here, Lord? Speak to them, Lord. Lord, do according to your good pleasure and will for their lives, and that we would preach the gospel, Lord, with our mouths, and that we would live it in body, Lord. According to your good pleasure and will, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.